Okay, so apparently that's my cue. Good afternoon. Uh, fellow friends and uh, colleagues in the media industry, those who are joining in the physical room as well as those who are joining online, of course, good afternoon to you all, as well as some unfamiliar um, faces, the fellow stakeholders of the Old Mutual Group, a warm welcome to you and thanks so much for joining this afternoon. So it is essentially that time of the uh, year again, I suppose, when we do get to uh, unpack one of the most comprehensive sets of research as it does pertain to the financial standing of the working uh, South African, and uh, many of you will be aware that uh, the Old Mutual Savings and Investment Monitor has uh, been giving us these insights uh, since 2009. So it has been quite a long time, and uh, it's been a long time of seeing uh, very much a similar picture in the past 14 years in terms of the South Africans not doing enough uh, to adequately prepare for retirement. So I was here last year and I got to, uh, or, the, or had the privilege rather, of seeing some of the insights that came out of last year's survey, which of course was still in the middle of the uh, pandemic. And uh, what I did learn is that the pandemic did introduce some interesting changes and behaviors to, uh, with consumers and how they related with money. And I suppose it wasn't too much of a surprise, just given the fact that quite a lot of us were caught off guard uh, by our uh, salaries, being slashed, many people's salaries were slashed, many people lost their jobs as a result of the companies having uh, to shut down, and many people were caught off guard and realized that they didn't have enough for a rainy day. And so what the pandemic did in terms of influencing our behavior with money is that it made us uh, put a little bit more aside for this rainy day towards our nest egg. But uh, things are still tough, as I think a lot of people in this room can attest to. And although we've moved from the COVID crisis, we're now still in a cost of living crisis, very much so. I do know we had some positive inflation numbers released earlier on. Apparently, inflation is at its... Um, or it grew by the slowest pace uh, in uh, 20 months, according to Statistics South Africa, but it's still pretty high, right? And uh, unfortunately, right now, where we find ourselves as South Africans, the uh, only vaccine, as it were, that can cure this cost of living crisis or the ill health of some of our incomes from the outbreaks of the high inflation and record interest rates and low shedding as well is an economy that actually grows. Now, we don't know when that will actually happen. So as we wait, we unpack the uh, latest findings of the uh, OMSIM report for 2023, which ultimately were uh, or are being released against this backdrop that uh, hopefully um, has stuck in terms of the economic picture. We've got a wonderful uh, set of speakers, an excellent uh, set of speakers who will be drilling into the findings, speaking to the ec economic matters and the influence it is having on uh, people's attitude towards money. Um, as a result of the tough times, but this is something that has been in the pipeline for some time, there have been uh, changes to uh, regulation as it does pertain to how our pensions and provident funds are uh, managed and administered. And uh, I do believe that the uh, findings of this year's OMSIM reflect that, the two-part system, and how South Africans are feeling about the fact that they may not be able to access all their income at one go when they change jobs or should uh, they lose their job for any unfortunate uh, reason. So, so I'm looking forward, certainly personally myself, uh, by the way, my name is Fifi Peters, sorry to be rude, not introduce myself. I am looking forward to uh, hearing and seeing what uh, Old Mutual uh, does have uh, to reveal to us today. Uh, feel free uh, at any point in time to share any insights that you think will be useful to your fellow community of followers. Thread it, tweet it, whatever it. Um, just uh, do uh, ensure that uh, you are able to spread the word of any information that you think is uh, insightful uh, to the community so that they know better and uh, can hopefully do better. By the way, that's the hashtag, know better, do better. Um, we'll be able to pick up uh, your, um, your comments on social media using that. Uh, one or a few other housekeeping rules, if for any reason you do need to use the bathroom, uh, it is down the hall, uh, straight down the hall. The signage is uh, pretty green, like the color of my dress, you won't miss it. Um, also, uh, the, uh, all the material that will be available or that will be shared with us today, the presentations that will be made will be available to you to access uh, at a later stage. I'll just remind you of the link um, of, on the old mutual savings uh, monitor where you'll be able to access that information, particularly for those of you who will be 
writing stories today or even engaging with your various uh, stakeholders. And also, um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions and to engage with the various speakers that uh, will be presenting today. So please uh, do uh, take the opportunity to do so. Those of you who are in the room will be able to ask those questions physically to the online audience. Uh, you can do so, uh, sending the uh, questions in the comments uh, section. They will get to me and I'll be able to ensure that they get to the various speakers whom you want answers for. So with that said, let us begin uh, with a bird's eye view then of the economy, the macroeconomic picture as uh, Old Mutual sees it from its uh, viewpoint of what's happening locally, what's happening uh, globally, and how it does it pertain to savings and the investment culture in this country. And I'd like to uh, hand it over to a gentleman who's joining us from the Republic of Cape Town, uh, Mr. Esak Odendal, uh, Investment Analyst at Old Mutual, who'll lead this uh, presentation for us. Esak, good afternoon. So we had some wonderful numbers coming out from Sats' uh, essay regarding inflation, and I'm hoping that your presentation will include some good news about what the Reserve Bank will do uh, to us tomorrow. No pressure uh, if it doesn't, but it's over to you, sir. Thank you, Fifi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Let's start the macroeconomic backdrop globally. Um, the cost of living crisis is not just a South African phenomenon. It's been a, a global phenomenon. Uh, we've seen inflation across the world being elevated um, and, and being slow in coming down. So there is progress, especially if we look at America, and that's one of the reasons the markets have been quite chirpy the last uh, the last week or so, is there is progress in America, not so much in the UK or Europe. Um, but I think the bottom line with, with the global inflation story, and by the way, this chart just looks at core inflation, so we're completely excluding the impact of, of very volatile food and fuel prices, just the core element still elevated. And I think as a result, global picture is going to be one of interest rates remaining elevated for some time until central banks really have the conviction that uh, inflation is going to, 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 to fall and stay low. And, and they don't want to, to repeat the, the, the mistakes they made during the last big inflationary period in the 1970s when inflation, um, you know, when they cut rates too quickly and inflation then and then resurfaced. So I think globally it is a, it is a higher for longer interest rate environment. I think even with inflation in the US coming down a bit, um, not expecting the Federal Reserve there to, to cut rates anytime soon, although I, I do think they are close to the peak of the of the global interest rate cycle, which in turn does take a bit of pressure off our own Reserve Bank um, when when they when they uh, meet tomorrow and in, in the subsequent months. Um, if we look at our own inflation numbers, unfortunately, this chart does not include this morning's numbers, but as Fifi correctly pointed out, inflation has fallen even further down now to 5.4%, to, uh, so within the 3 to 6% target range. Core inflation, which again removes the impact of volatile food and food prices, that is down to 5%. Um, and I think against this backdrop of inflation now surprising to the downside, uh, plus, we've seen the RAND strengthen quite a bit um, in the last few weeks, so it's it's way, it's much better than that sort of 1980 level that it touched in the month of May. It's now sort of just below 18 to the dollar. I think all that will give the Reserve Bank um, enough reason to pause to tomorrow in the rate announcement. Um, although I do expect it's still to be a fairly close call, so maybe it's a 3-2 decision on the on the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, if they do hike tomorrow, um, that'll probably be the last in the cycle. So I think the worst is behind us, both in terms of in terms of the interest rate outlook and and the inflation outlook. And again, uh, as Fifi correctly pointed out, what inflation measures is not um, whether prices are falling. So if you're saying that inflation is falling, we don't mean that prices are coming down. We mean that prices are rising at a slower pace. Okay, so that that's quite important to know. Prices are still rising at a pace of um, five and a half percent, but that is way down from the almost eight percent that we saw uh, in the middle in the middle of last year. So, so in South Africa, I think the inflation story is moving in the right direction. 
um, that is certainly good news for for South African consumers because, of course, as inflation comes down, um, people's spending power in real terms uh, improves. So there's a bit of good news for consumers. Obviously, if you think about the impact of, of interest rates, it's it's been a squeeze, right? So if you just use an example of a, of a million rand mortgage, you, you were paying 7,700 7, um, during this period where rates bottomed uh, in 2020 and 2021. And that's now up to 10,800. Um, so that's quite a big a big increase in uh in the monthly repayments of, of households. But bear in mind, most households in South Africa don't actually have a mortgage. So this impacts very much uh, that segment of the market that actually has a mortgage or has a vehicle loan. Um, that is that is not everyone. If you look at the Reserve Bank's numbers, the uh, on the left um, here is, is the debt service ratio. That's the portion of income that is being spent by South African households on making interest payments. Um, and as you can see, that has obviously increased quite sharply with the interest rates. Uh, it's now just above 8%, but it's sort of in line with the uh, the average of the previous decade. So even though rates have gone up very sharply, and because it's such a, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's one of the sharpest rate cycles we've had in South Africa in some time, um, we haven't seen it putting that much of a squeeze on consumer households. And the reason is because if you look on, on this side of the panel, um, the debt to income ratio has actually declined. So over the last um, 15 years, since since 2008, South Africans have seen their incomes grow faster than than their debt levels, right? So there hasn't been much borrowing and there has been reasonable income growth. And as a result, households have deleveraged over this period. Obviously, there was a bit of a spike in COVID where, where incomes basically um, ground to a halt. But yeah, so this is a picture of, 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 a, of a consumer that over the last decade or so hasn't really increased its borrowing that much relative to incomes. Now, obviously, this is the aggregate number. Um, South Africa is a very unequal society, so so um, aggregates hide a lot. And I think there's, there's great value in the, in the savings and investment monitor because that gives us a lot of granular detail around uh, different income groups and so on. But just looking from a top down, um, because ultimately it's the aggregate Income numbers is the aggregate debt numbers that give us the aggregate spending numbers that then give us the picture of what the economy is doing. So that's that's why this is important. So yes, as I say in the heading here, consumers are down, but they're not completely out as a result of these rate increases. Interesting finding that we that um, I think we will we will hear about later on this afternoon. But what you also see in the on, in the survey by the Bureau for Economic Research is that households are a lot more pessimistic. And this survey goes back well into the 1980s. Households are a lot more pessimistic about the country than their own financial position. They're not optimistic about their own financial position. This is hovering around zero, but they're much more pessimistic about the country. And I think this is where the issues are around load shedding, poor growth, job prospects, political uncertainty. We've got an election next year, possibly coalition governments. Um, you know, so as South Africans, as, as, as a group, we are very... Um, very pessimistic bunch at the moment. Um, you know, maybe a good World Cup can can sort that out for us. But 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 definitely, a lot of South Africans are just feeling gloomy about the prospects for for the South African economy. And I think some of the OMSIM results will will bear that out. If we then move um, towards just looking at what investors have been doing, um, obviously, if you're going to save money, it's also a good idea to invest some of that money to get a decent return. Now, first of all, the one benefit of higher interest rates, of course, is that if you are saving money, you now earn a better return on that money. You know, if you can put in, even in a, in a low risk money market fund or a bank account, you can earn around 8%. Uh, inflation is now at 5.5%. That's a very decent real um, yield that you can earn in those kind of very safe products. So, so you know, for a long time in the industry, we sort of spoke about cash being trash. That's no longer the case uh, in South Africa and across the world. Cash is a, is a much more attractive investment. Bonds, an attractive investment. Fixed income, generally an attractive investment. Um, I think the perception that South African returns have been very poor is one that's out there. And I think maybe that'll persuade some people that it's not even worth investing. It's not even worth saving. But if you look at the returns that that 
South Africans have generated over the last three years, and I know this is just a snapshot of one specific period, but it's just indicative um, up till the end of June. You know, you still got pretty decent annual returns from, from, from SA equity, from global equity, obviously helped a bit by quite a weak rand. South African bonds, you know, giving you an above inflation uh, return there. Um, cash over this whole period is 4%, but as I say, that, that return is now shooting up as, as Reserve Bank is, is hiking rates. So, so overall, you know, I don't think South Africans have, have earned, you know, if you've been investing in a diversified portfolio, uh, maybe the returns have not been as, as good as you would have expected, but they certainly have not been catastrophic, bearing in mind everything that's gone wrong over the last couple of years, you know, COVID and the riots in 2021 and the floods and 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 the, the, the really severe load shedding, the political uncertainty, the issues around, you know, our relationship with Russia or alleged relationship with Russia. So all of these things, but all in the pot. Um, but yeah, the outcome has not been has not been that terrible. And I think the, the message remains that if you if you're going to save and you're going to invest, you know, just spread your risk around, be diversified, but also but also be patient um, and don't wait for things to get better before you start investing. Often when things are uncertain, it's the best time to invest because that's when you get the, the best opportunities on on markets. So, so just in summary, I think, um, as I said, it's it's uh, although inflation is coming down, which is obviously good news for for consumers globally, but also for for financial markets. Um, I don't think we we completely there yet, and I think central banks will maintain interest rates at current levels, uh, the highest levels in two decades at least, some cases three decades, for for the, a good couple of months, possibly into into next year. Uh, this is a very different environment than when the one we saw pre-COVID, which was low inflation and, and ultra low interest rates. So, so we're in a very different world today now following the pandemic globally. Locally, I think, as I said, there's a great degree of pessimism. Uh, people are despondent, they're unsure, they don't know what's going to happen with the country. Uh, there are signs of improvement. I think the load shedding is our biggest challenge. And fortunately, we are, we are solving that. We are solving that one solar panel at a time. Um, you know, businesses and households can now put up as much solar capacity as they want. Um, they can even sell some of that into the grid. So, so the fact that the energy market has been completely deregulated and, and opened up, I think, is an example of, of what we can do to solve our problems. Um, hopefully we can see some of that in, in other sectors, in logistics, in ports and so on, and that will help the economy uh, to perform much better than, than what it's been uh, doing over the last uh, over the last while. I think obviously as inflation comes down, we might see confidence improving a bit, uh, consumers feeling a bit better about their, about their financial situation. So yes, there are lots of challenges, but I think um, we are sort of at the low point for, for the local economy. Um, you know, this is a very difficult period, but, but uh, you, you know, w without, uh, Without trying to, uh, to 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 put a curse on it or anything, um, I'll, I'll just touch wood here. But I do think the outlook uh, the outlook is better because you know inflation is coming down. I think we're at near the peak of the interest rate cycle. Um, we're seeing improvement in terms of load shedding, even the last the last few weeks. But also just the fact that there's so much investment into electricity capacity. And then finally, I think the message remains that if you have a long term goal or a short term goal. Um, financial goal and you need to invest, then don't wait for, for everything to be moonshine and roses. Don't wait for things to be certain and economic growth to be strong and everyone to be optimistic because you're going to miss out. Um, the best time to invest is always uh, now. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. I like what you did there uh, with the solar panels. And it will be interesting to learn, though, uh, how South Africans are affording to solve for the load shedding a crisis one solar panel at the time and what um, has had to give for a lot of people to be able to do so. Um, I think that it was such a nice uh, aggregate picture that we did get in terms of how we are responding to debt. It was interesting literally for me to learn right now that in the past 10 years, uh, we haven't really moved the dial in terms of the amount of debt that we've packed on our balance sheets as a household. And so the contributions have been a little bit less at aggregate level. 
but now it's about the granular level and what that looks like. Yes, like I can uh, please ask you not to go too far. There's a question or two that's already come uh, through to you from our online audience. Um, and so those of you who haven't sent any, please do so. Also, uh, I would like to apologize to the online uh, the audience. I do understand that there's some uh, audio challenges. We're working on it, and uh, perhaps the team has already worked to fix it. So uh, please be patient with us in that regard. So to get uh, to move then from the, the, the bird's eye picture to the granule uh, picture as to the findings of this year's OMSIM and what it looks like at granular level, um, I would like to uh, please welcome uh, Vuyokazi Mabude. Uh, she is the Head of Knowledge and Insights at Old Mutual, and uh, she'll be unpacking the report for us. Uh, Vuyo, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Fifi, for that intro. Isak tried to steal our presentation, as you guys already heard, but we do have an advantage on, on him. Um, because we did actually speak to 1,518 people to give you guys the view that we'll be sharing this afternoon. Um, and so as many of you know, the Old Mutual Savings and Investments Monitor is an annual survey that we conduct online with working South Africans. And really the focus is around what are people financial, people's financial habits, what are their behaviors, what are they doing and not doing, and what are their attitudes to a lot of the saving and investment areas that we, we see in our country. And so getting straight into the results, I think, and this is some of the stuff that Isaac has already spoken to, load shedding, you know, the depreciation of the RAND, there were a lot of things that consumers were facing this year. And we can see that in the confidence levels. So people's confidence in the South African economy is at an all-time low, unfortunately. So it's sitting at 27%. Previously, I think around 2015, we were sitting at 54%. So you can see the really sharp decline in terms of confidence in the South African economy. As he mentioned, their prospects in terms of their personal finances are a bit more positive, but still, you know, very, very negative from a, a economy perspective. And I think this paints a great picture of you being able to see just what has changed in the last year. So the picture on the left-hand side is what people said they were thinking about when they thought about their finances. And you can see right in the middle, savings, people were building up buffers, they were coming out of COVID, really looking to make a, a, an impact from a saving perspective. Versus 2023, and you can see already stress. That's the, the big thing that people have in their minds when they're looking at their finances. Saving is still there. People are still trying to make ends meet. They're still trying to save where they can, but really, really, really the, the focus of what is actually happening from a financial perspective for working South Africans is there is a lot of stress. And we see that even when we look at specifically how has people's income shifted. And so what you're looking at here is over the last couple, and this is actually a question we looked at specifically from a pandemic perspective, but we're using it now even looking forward in terms of the coming years, how is people's income shifting? And so you can see 70% of working South Africans actually do not earn more now than they did pre-pandemic. So versus three years ago, they're actually earning the same or less, right? And the impact of that is that with all the inflation and everything that's happening, it makes it even harder for them to make ends meet in real terms. So they actually have less money in real terms. And although we are still seeing that slight improvement from a people earning more perspective, this is really more concentrated amongst younger consumers. So this is a younger cohort, people under 30 starting jobs, their poly jobs, as you'll see in a bit when we talk about how they have multiple income streams. And the large portion, though, of working South Africans really, really under a lot of financial stress and struggling from an income perspective as well. And when we get into some of the coping mechanisms and their priorities, so in terms of priorities, this hasn't shifted. And, we, uh, you know, I think we've spoken about this in the past. The pattern is the same. Job security is number one. Cutting expenses is number two. Paying debt is number three. And then you start getting into invest in investments and savings. When we look at that overall, you can see already from an emergency savings perspective, there is a slight decline there. It is still a priority, but the other stuff that you see coming to the surface has just taken up more space than in previous years. Coming into income and expense management, this is where people are getting smart with their money. And 
in this regard, they've just gotten smarter and smarter. So people are still using rewards programs, so 70%, it's up from 66% in the past. Still switching to cheaper streaming options, which is terrible news for, I won't say which brand. <laughs> you know, people are, are starting again, continuing to switch brands in terms of supermarkets that they shop at. And something which actually is new from a, um, income and expense management perspective is people actually maintaining and repairing things versus replacing them. So again, people are getting very, very smart with their money. I want to re-emphasize that, that this is not a consumer who is reckless with their money. They are making savings and finding ways to stretch their money as much as possible. And again, how can they do that as well from an income perspective is being a poly jobber. So this is someone who has multiple income streams. So whether that's multiple jobs or and or multiple income streams, for example, young people are using social media as one of the avenues to earn multiple incomes. And you can see there's a sharp increase here from 18 to 29 year olds. In last year, we had 60% who were poly jobbers. This year, it's sitting at 70%. So this has become the norm. So again, People are not just focused on income, well, securing their jobs and their income, they're also finding new avenues of making that income. And when we look at savings buffers, so we've spoken to this, savings is still a priority, but unfortunately for most people, the reality is that they don't actually have a savings buffer. So 62% of South, of South Africans are saying, actually, if I had to lose my job today, I wouldn't have saving reserves to last me three months and more. So everyone else is kind of sitting in this one month to two month space and some with most actually 30% have even less savings than they could continue for a month. And what are they doing when it comes to insurance? So again, here we are, we are, we are encouraged that people are not completely canceling protection cover. However, they are switching to cheaper options. So people are starting to to trim, again, where they can, even from an insurance perspective. So especially around medical aid and short-term insurance, you're seeing those, those um, switches that people are doing to say, actually, if I can find a cheaper solution, then that's what I'm going to move to. But penetration levels are stable, which is encouraging because it does show us that people know that protection cover is important and it doesn't put them at risk, obviously, if they have any unexpected expenses. And then finally, just getting into financial advice. So we spoke to, you know, as, as Isak was saying, and giving some investment advice about the best time to save is now. Unfortunately, most South Africans actually don't have a financial advisor, which is something that would be a really great solution in these times, particularly when you are struggling with different elements from a financial perspective, it really is important to get the right financial advice. And so currently at the moment, six out of 10 South Africans don't actually have a financial advisor. And this is something that definitely for us is a huge opportunity for people to just get themselves the right financial advice um, and, and be able to manage their finances, but with a, a, a better perspective and a, and a more well-rounded perspective. And then getting into debt, and this is where we start to see really the impact of some of those areas like not having financial advice across the board. When we ask people how they made ends meet this year, we are starting to see indebtedness grow. So whether it's borrowing money from family and friends, taking out personal loans, dipping into your savings, all of those have increased this year in the past year. And particularly when we look at personal loans and people taking personal loans, this has doubled since 2020. So people are definitely more indebted now than they have been in, in previous years. And when we look at the reasons for that debt, this again becomes a little bit more concerning because it's to make ends meet. It is to pay another debt, for example, or to pay every everyday expenses. So people are not just more indebted, but they're more indebted for everyday expenses and to pay off other debt which can become quite a vicious cycle and is a little bit concerning from our perspective. And when you look at, at repaying loans, uh, in particular, the two examples that we have here are people who have approached a creditor in the last year. So one in four have gone back to their creditors to make arrangements for payments because they are not able to keep up with their payment plans. And secondly, when you look at home loans, and Isaac used an example of home loans 
shifting from a, on a million rand bond, shifting from 7,000 rand to 10,000 rand in just the space of a year and a half to two years. Again, we're starting to see that from a consumer level, one in three are actually already struggling to make their home repayments or they've actually fallen behind. So about 11% have actually already fallen behind on their bond payments. Finally, just getting into savings and key saving goals. So again, I think we spoke to the fact that for most people, saving is important. They know it's important. They want to save. However, if you look at the top three goals from a saving perspective, you will see that actually retirement is first, which is, is good news. But the next two are actually emergency savings and paying debt. So again, it's not things that are actually long-term savings. These are short-term resolutions to other problems that people are struggling with, like being indebted, like needing to build emergency savings for any situation that might arise. And then finally, just looking quickly at pension reform. So when we look at the pension reform, we track awareness. So from an awareness perspective, there has been a slight in increase in terms of the number of people who are aware that there's potentially some um, pe pension reform. However, from a sentiment perspective, quite consistent with what we saw last year. So mostly positive, some people neutral, but very few people quite negative about it. However, what we did do this year was look at past behavior, just as almost a predictor of what would people do if they were able to take to change jobs or have left a job in the last two years. And what we found is that only 29% of people preserved all of their retirement savings. Everyone else who's left or changed jobs in the last two years has taken a portion of that money. Some have reinvested some of that money, but overall, only just under 30% actually reinvested the full pension amount. And then just a quick recap, we, did, we didn't have time, so again, and I think we've, we've spoken to this and Fifi mentioned, you will have access to the full reports. There is a lot more detail that's involved in, in the OMSIM report every year. So we didn't touch on a lot of the things around load shedding. You can find all of that data, how much people are spending. People have unfortunately gone into debt as well to solve and find solutions for load shedding, so buying generators or inverters. People have gone into debt for that, but you will find those in the full report. Just to quickly recap on the key insights, South Africans remain resilient. They are finding ways to stretch their income, and whether that's through rewards programs or re keeping items versus replacing them. Multiple streams are now a norm, so people are looking, are, are poly jobbers and are looking for more income streams where they can find them. Thirdly, again, we've spoken to people are trying to make ends meet, and to do that, some people have gone into debt, unfortunately. So 34% of people taking a personal loan in the last year and quite significantly higher than what we've seen since the pandemic. Uh, fourth is on savings buffers. So most people do not actually have a savings buffer if they lost their income. Four in 10 have a financial advisor. The majority do not. Seven out of 10 people do not see an improvement in terms of their income and therefore they are still quite financially stressed overall. Single moms, and this is again some of the data that you would see in the full report, 15% of working South Africans are single moms. And what that speaks to really is this, this sense that the more vulnerable cohorts in our, our society and in our communities are just getting more vulnerable because they are more indebted, they are more financially stressed, they have less of a savings buffer than the average South African so again, there's some interesting stats and, and information coming out around single moms. And then when we get into uh, savings priorities, again, retirement is at the top of the list. But shortly after that, you start to look at things like emergency savings and paying off debt, which does suggest that consumers are actually still grappling quite significantly around the savings space, given their financial situation right now. Second last point is just really around protection cover. Great to see that penetration levels are stable. However, people are starting to trim cover where they can. And really the encouragement is just to make sure that people have the right level of insurance and cover for their, their assets. And John will get into the detail on some of that around financial education. And then lastly, with regards to pension reform, we have seen that quite stable in terms of, of awareness and sentiment. But based on last be previous behavior, we did see a lot of people have taken um, their funds 
and some did reinvest them, but most took the funds. So that's the quick snapshot on the OMSIM findings for this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, what, what I personally enjoy about the OMSIM report is that I think it speaks to all of us, right? I think somewhere you identify you, where you land in terms of how you are responding to this situation uh, right now. But I do like the emphasis that you did make in terms of South Africans were not necessarily reckless, no, I don't want to save, save for what, save for who, because that's often the perception. It's the circumstance, right? For a lot of us, it is a circumstance. Um, and also it's the fact that uh, we don't seek out financial advice as much as we should. So our next speaker is going to give us an on the house financial session, uh, really crystallizing the findings, uh, making and packaging, packaging them into nice practical financial tips uh, for us to share with our various audience, particularly for those of you who are writing stories. So I think I like referring him to for referring to him as the uh, don of financial education in my view um who is just able to simplify financial matters like no other in my view um and yes he paid me to say that no i'm joking uh, <laughs> um ladies and uh, gentlemen uh, if we can just uh, please uh, welcome on stage mr john Mangike, who heads up financial education um, at Old Mutual. Thank you, Fifi, um, and thanks to my colleagues, uh, my colleague uh, Vuyokazi, for uh, those insights. Um, you see, for me, there are two things that are important for me when it comes to OMSIM. So, yes, we can see this picture of uh, how hard things are, how tough things are for consumers. But the big question is, what should a consumer do? Because if I paint a picture and say, hey, things are bad, but I don't tell you what you need to do, I'm not sure if we are helping anyone. So it's very important to also look at what should people do under those circumstances. Um, because very often when I talk to my colleague, uh, Isaac, an economist, and also Johan Els, after they've said, I said, what did you just say in plain and simple language? What did you just, I know you spoke English, but can you use other English? Um, because a consumer needs to understand uh, what it means. So what I'm going to try and do is just do a bit of a voice voiceover on uh, some of the uh, insights or some of the stats that are there without repeating what the numbers are telling us. You know, when somebody starts borrowing money from family and friends, you know the situation is dire. You know, we are social beings, but even as social beings, we have our pride. Uh, in a good way, um, if, if I should say, because you don't want your family to know that this is the problem one. This is the borrow. In fact, when they see you coming from a distance, they say, ah, this one is coming to borrow money again. Um, and, and I don't think you want that. I mean, of course, when people get themselves, find themselves in that situation, it's because they, out of desperation, uh, they find themselves having to borrow there. So for me, um, I would encourage people to actually have a budget, but it's not enough to have a budget. It's how do you stick to a budget? In fact, a person who has a budget, but doesn't st stick to it, has the same challenges as somebody who actually doesn't budget at all, because you're not sticking to the budget. So I think for those who are borrowing from family and friends, uh, the only way of encouragement for me is rather have a budget than stick to it, you know, so that you don't have uh, your family sending their children to you to say they're coming to collect, they must come and collect the parcel. You know, they, they, they have their own politeness uh, when they want their money back, they ask for a parcel. <laughs> and then of course the poly job us. I mean, what is also quite clear is that the days of relying on a single income are over. But having said that, we need to be very careful because employers have policies in place. Uh, so it's important for you not to find yourself being in conflict uh, with your employer. So do it within reason, within context, and complying with whatever policies of your employer. So don't neglect your primary job. Uh, I think that's in plain and simple terms. Of course, one of the challenges uh, that we find ourselves in is you, for those who are actually having a second income is to assume or take a view that this second income is actually money they never had or it's an extra income. 
The very same mindset is the very same mindset that's going to desensitize you to blow that money because you have a feeling that this is extra money. So don't look at that as extra money. It's a second income. I mean, and, and, and I think if you use that money wisely to pay debt faster and actually have something, uh, create a room to actually start saving. Uh, so that's what I would encourage uh, people to do. Because if you have a second income, but you don't have a purpose, you don't have a goal for it, there's a problem. Because when it comes to money, one of the key principles uh, there is where, when purpose is unknown, abuse is guaranteed. And that's why we've got a show called I Blew It uh, to feature people who uh, had lots of money, but there was no purpose. Uh, so always have a goal. And, and I always encourage people who are saving to say, don't save with if, you, if you don't have a goal. Have a goal, because that is the one thing that's going to help you with a bit of uh, discipline there. And then, of course, the issue of stock fails. I mean, stock fails have been around for quite some time, uh, the informal savings. Um, and I think what is encouraging for me is that there are certainly stock fails that are moving towards partnering with formal financial uh, institutions in order to leverage the power of compound interest. Uh, you know, I always make this example to say, if you're a stock fell and you are taking groceries annually in December and you get a bulk share of the groceries because you've been saving the whole year uh, for that, imagine getting 36 bottle of, bottles of mayonnaise in December with an expiry date of March the following year. That's why I'm saying I, I guarantee you one day we're going to hear someone saying, Mayonnaise is good for skin, so that they, this thing doesn't get to an expiry date. So look, it's very important to, to have a long-term view. Um, and, and I'm encouraged to see that uh, some of the stock fells have do take a long-term view, and they do certainly partner. Uh, it's not just about holidays and so on. That's why today we're hearing of property stock fells. It means they are starting to look uh, long-term. Very, very important. So if you're a stock fell, remember, you know, compound interest is very key. And then what about the sandwich generation? I mean, for those who are still wondering, okay, what is sandwich generation? Okay. Um, well, the easiest way to say is the colloquial term for it is black tax. We don't like that term, mm -hmm. you know, so no, not because we want to be politically correct, but the reality is that we do have people who find themselves having to provide for their immediate family as well as extended family. The other day, a trade unionist asked, what do you mean, comrade, extended family? Because with us Africans, family is family. We don't have this thing immediate uh, versus extended. I said, for purpose of example, just accept, comrade, that there is also an extended family. So the reality here is, I mean, I, even a colleague of mine said to me, oh, hey, my family and this thing, I'm also sandwiched. There's only one solution for me that I believe uh, for those who are sandwiched or people who are paying in inverted commas black tax. For me, the best way is to is to empower your family uh, with some kind of uh, income uh, generating venture. It's, it's, it, it's, it's about a principle of teaching somebody how to fish instead of giving them a fish every day because they're gonna keep, keep coming back for more. In fact, they'll start styling. This time they want this type of fish, then next time they want a different type of fish and then you can keep up. So rather teach them how to fish, whether it's an outside room, uh, you know, an apartment uh, for a rental income or a spaza show, but do something to empower them. And from there, I think you will have the strength to say, I've empowered you. You, you need to depend on this venture uh, to live and don't look at me. So in that way, then you can focus on uh, a building or creating wealth and looking after your, your immediate uh, uh, family. So yeah, um, I, I know, um, especially amongst young people, I was counseling a young lady one time uh, for one of the shows, shows we did with one of the uh, TV channels, and she was so angry. In fact, not, in fact, even angry is an understatement. She was extremely disturbed. So there's a, there are mental health issues when it comes to the, this particular subject. It's an emotional one. In her case, she decided to block her family completely and said, I don't want to hear from anybody from my family. I've had it you do find young people like that. So young people are divided on this subject. Others, they, they believe it's a good thing, and I, I, and I certainly agree it is a good thing, but to the extent that if you are doing it resentfully, 
there's a problem. Um, so that's why there are some serious health uh, issues. Keeping cash, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide before I get misinterpreted. Uh, all I can say, the big principle is uh, money under the mattress or anywhere else at home is not the safest place to put the money. Um, hey, let me not uh, elaborate. Can I pass on this one? <laughs> Please allow me to pass on. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, that's not me who said that. So let me pass on that one. But I think you, are, you understand the point. I mean, you get the point uh, uh, that I made. All right, so let me uh, move on to the issue of financial advice. If you have a plumbing problem, you speak to a plumber. If you have a medical problem, you speak to a medical doctor. You have a legal problem, you go to a lawyer. If you want to plan for your future, speak to a financial advisor. Our challenge is this DIY approach. The reality is no, you are not a jack of all trade. You are not, particularly as far as finances is concerned. Find an expert in that area to help you to plan. I mean, if you, look, if you saw the slide from Isaac about the different uh, asset classes and the returns there, for me, that is mind-blowing to see that actually the returns are different. It depends on uh, the asset class there that you're putting your money in. But it also helps those of us who are thinking of putting our eggs in one basket. You realize that there's certainly opportunity uh, or, you know, in, in looking at different asset classes. And that is the role of a financial advisor. So I certainly encourage uh, those of us uh, who last saw an advisor five years ago, uh, it's the right time to speak to an advisor. Even if you last saw an advisor last year, at least once a year, have a chat. It doesn't mean when you greet an advisor and the advisor say hello, there must be an invoice. <laughs> people, think, people think advisors work like car guards. You know a car guard in the parking lot, as soon as he greets you, and you greet back, you have an outstanding balance <laughs> because you've greeted back. It doesn't work like that with an advisor. Check in with your advisor uh, from time to time. Let me play this clip quickly and I'll explain to you why. I mean, we, we have this podcast on YouTube. Uh, it's called Old Mutual on the Money. We talk to different types of people and they share with us some of their insights in terms of how, in terms of their journey when it comes to money. Let's look at this. What I know about money now and what I didn't know then is because then I didn't have money. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm trying to save the little that I have. You know, in 2020, I turned 55. Mm. And I'm happy to say I had about three retirement annuities. Mm. So I want to urge young people to say, when you have it now, mm. try and invest it because tomorrow may never cater for itself. Mm. You know, saving money, investing money, that has really helped me to put me where I am. I love what you just said now because I'm seeing a person with many hats. I try, I hustle, you know, for different businesses. So the little that I have, I want that money to work for me. Yes. Money doesn't grow in trees. Money comes and goes. I respect money. Yeah. I mean, for somebody who doesn't have a nine to five to talk like that, that's financial wisdom right there. So, and I, I don't think I want to elaborate on, on, on what she said. All right, um, second last slide. You know, when it comes to retirement, I mean, uh, you know, this whole de debate about retirement reform, uh, reform uh, you know, people still have mixed feelings. Uh, is it a good thing? Is it not a, a good thing? And, um, and these are some of the stats that are coming through. But the reality is, Yes, uh, for the first time, people would have, will have a bit of early access to their retirement. What does this mean? It means you are borrowing from your future, in simple terms. You, when, you, uh, when you start accessing that, it means you are borrowing from the future. It's the same thing as driving a car where there's a balloon facility. It simply means, I know it's painful to say, it simply means you can't afford that car, but because they're trying to accommodate you, they've created a balloon facility. Same thing here, when you start accessing that money early, it means you are borrowing from the future. Yes, we know that there are uh, real challenges that people experience and they, um, they feel that there's no other way, but even our definition of emergency is going to be tested once people start having access uh, 
to that money. Here is my favorite slide, to be honest. If you want to know how South Africans are coping, how resilient are South Africans, this is the slide for me. Um, because, as I said when I started speaking, that it's really about what now? So what? I've heard these stats, so what? And for me, uh, I think this should be our, for lack of a better word, this should be our guiding light in terms of how do we navigate uh, uh, difficult uh, times. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over back uh, to Fifi. Um, although I think it is uh, a, a bit worrying, uh, the trend uh, of cutting down on domestic help. I get it from an expense point of view. No, 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 don't, I, 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 don't be fooled by this manicure. This, these, these hands work. But if you actually look at the uh, level of uh, unemployment amongst domestic helpers, when those statistics are released, it is uh, on the app. And so the question is, what do they do um, as a result of us managing our expenses? But that is a, a story uh, for another day. And I actually want to say um, the, the reason why I speak so highly of John, so as a lot of South Africans, Sandwich generation, black tax, so we had family responsibility. I haven't told you this, but uh, from a conversation that I had uh, with you on um, SAFM when you came through and you spoke about, okay, how do we move beyond black tax and seeing how you can empower uh, the family member that is dependent on you so that over time they become least dependent and everybody is happy. So my brother is now in chef school. Yes, yes, I know, I know, he's very happy. <laughs> it's a two-year course, and uh, ultimately, from that conversation, I said, okay, how do we fix this thing as a family? And uh, yeah, he's in chef school, and after that, after two years, I think that he'll be in a much better position to take care of himself and his obligations, and uh, I'll be a little bit more, yeah, uh, least, <laughs> least anxious and less stressed as uh, Woya did uh, show us that, that depiction. So, uh, so Amsum's done things a little bit differently this year, uh, just in terms of inviting an outside view to give uh, uh, their critique and their um, analysis and their feedback on some of their findings and also how it does pertain to some of the data that they look at on a day-to-day -day basis when it does uh, come to the South African economy and uh, the consumer savings and investments and the like. So at this point, um, just yeah, a reminder that uh, John uh, Woya will be available for questions, Isaac, after. But before that stage, I would like to invite on stage um, Prof. Yaku Foshe from the uh, Northwest University just to give us his thoughts and his take on the findings. Prof. Thank you very much, Fifi. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to, to sort of give a little bit of a reflection from the outside on what you have seen today. And unfortunately for you, um, I have to get a little bit academic. I mean, just, that's just in my nature. But fortunately, John will speak after me again and he will translate it um, into something much better. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just refer to, to three aspects. Firstly, a little bit of validation on what you have just seen. I mean, in research, that's all about it. Can we trust this? How does this compare? Then I want to talk a little bit about the implications of what we have seen for ordinary South Africans. And lastly, um, I want to look at a little bit of application. And the reason for doing that is that often we as researchers look at the stats and we forget that there are real people with real families, with real stories behind that stats. In the past two weeks, and I want you to imagine you being, let's call him Desmond. I was talking to this gentleman that has now retired. He took his lump sum, wanted to buy a house so that he doesn't need to pay rent anymore after retirement, misjudged himself on the lump sum tax, ended up with a shortfall for buying this house that they signed the offer to purchase to buy cash. The owner wants to cancel the contract now. He has already spent money on improvements on the house. Talk to him. He cannot get finance because of his credit score. And you can see the desperation in his face and in his eyes. 
And that for me is the story behind the stats that we are looking at this afternoon. So on validation, that's about does this what the savings and investment monitor does um, do what it's supposed to do? Now, I'm not going to go into all the details there, but I think if we look at it overall, the methodology is sound. What they have been doing is sound. They've been doing it for a few years. Um, the sample size, the population representativeness is all there. I want to spend a few moments, however, with consistency with existing knowledge. How does this compare? And I've literally just taken out one thing for some of the, of the remarks, just showing you that this is echoed throughout literature. That move in the word cloud from savings to stress. We see it all over, an increase in mental um, health issues because this stress is directly linked to things like depression, high blood pressure. So that stress has an impact on people's physical health and mental health. The sandwich generation that you have heard about um, and linking back to what, what John also said, borrowing from, from family and friends. The middle age generation are caring for their parents who have not saved enough. And if I ask you today, what would you not do to give your kids a brighter future? You would go hungry to give them that. And that's literally what's happening. People are investing to provide better futures for their children. Then we have heard about the story of the single mothers, the vulnerable groups. Sad news, 42% of households in South Africa are headed by females. That's a big proportion, and most of them double-generation households. That's the reality. I um, sit at my son's school with the parents that apply for the um, sh um, a discount on their, on their school fees, and the stories are terrific. I want to, it's not people that make stupid decisions. It's not people that don't want to pay. It's people that literally have to choose between school fees and feeding their children. That's the reality. And then we also know about the youth unemployment and the struggles of our elderly. We said that two in three people cannot survive for three months. Looking at some of the latest stats, South Africa has a negative, the households have a negative savings ratio meaning that we are using savings just to get by. Then we also saw the statistics that when we do take out credit, it's the expensive, short-term, unsecured credit. And that leads to people falling behind, not being able to pay off their debt, borrowing to pay off other debt, adding to what we have already heard from um, Isaac, increases in interest rates. And although... The, the debt-to-income ratio has come down. What we do see is that the value of civil, civil judgments for debt is on the increase. 71% of people cashing in some of their or all of their retirement savings. Some of the other stats saying that two in three people that's belonging to a pension fund have total savings of 50,000 rands in that pension fund. How long can you survive with 50,000 rands the day that you retire. And that's worrying, talking again about the sandwich generation. Then um, we also, had, or it was also referred this morning to behavior. So I want to link that to behavioral finance, which is a, where we link psychology to financial decisions. And if we look at um, one of the things that, that we have seen um, in the, the broader old mutual survey is an increase in gambling, online gambling. And that links to prospect theory where people, especially if they're becoming desperate, overweigh low probabilities. And linking to that, when you have literally nothing to lose, it cannot get much worse, people risk more. They gamble more because how bad can it be? And then what John also referred to, the windfall, the polyjobbers, 
that extra money, linking that to mental accounting, which also tells us that when people get this windfalls, they, and the amount does have some influence on that, but they normally spend it. It's not part of their savings. So what's the implications of all of this? I want to take it together with the three reasons why I believe people need to save. Number one is for financial security, that emergencies, short term, so that when something bad happens, we can survive. Number two is long-term goals, of which retirement is probably the most important one. So we are building wealth, we are increasing our financial prosperity. And then the last one that I think is often ignored is making use of opportunities. The opportunity to start a business on the side, to buy a property at a good price. And the problem is, if we don't save, it's a vicious cycle. We cannot deal with the short-term problems. And if we cannot deal with short-term problems, we cannot look at the long-term impact, which means that the future cannot change. And if I don't have any of these savings, my chances of making use of opportunities is drastically reduced. So people not saving is a much bigger problem um, than just for, their, for themselves. I said that I wanted to bring it a bit closer because there are real people behind the story. So what I wanted to do is, um, let's take Desmond again. I looked at average salaries in 2022, 2023, looked at Stats SA, why, what do people spend their money on, the categories, and then looked at the different inflation rates for those categories. So let's take Desmond who earned 25,300 in 2022. So, and that links to the findings of the survey. He probably now earns the same, perhaps a little bit more. Thankful there was some um, tax relief, so earning 4% more than what he did last year. But taking the other inflation rates into account, Desmond will now have 600 rands a month less. Where do you get this from? Can I cancel all my insurance? Should I not pay the school fees? Should I cancel my cell phone contract or my medical insurance? What do I do to make up the shortfall? And what we do see is that those items that have the highest weighting in my basket also in the past year had the highest inflation. And furthermore, and I do appreciate the fact, and we have seen that in, in research as well, of before and after COVID, that South Africans are remarkably resi resilient. But if we look at the things where the working people are saving on, it's on the smaller items in the budget. It's not going to make a huge impact. And my view behind that is that they have already cut the food budget to the bone. Yes, they are making use of, of more rewards, but you, you, you cannot eat less. You, you have to feed your family. And if we look at that, um, just housing and utilities, I mean, I come from Potjofstrom, which I hope is cheaper than the metropolitan areas, but I can honestly tell you I don't know where I will live for 5,596 rands, including utilities. That's just the reality. And then what the survey also pointed out is that people are saving on insurance, cutting on insurance. And we know that in South Africa, we generally have an insurance gap. So that problem is only becoming better. And you, we already don't have savings addressing the short term and the emergencies. And now you are taking away the safety net that's supposed to care for that. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a bleak picture. But for me, it's the reality that the average working South African is facing. And it's the reality that I see when I talk to people on a daily basis. And 
I want to leave you with five thoughts this afternoon. This survey is on working South Africans. I cannot start to imagine what the 34% unemployed people is going through. But, not to end you in, in total depression, what can we do about this? And that's, um, I had a nice chat with, with John earlier. I'm so glad for the work that they are doing. There's three doing things that can be done. Number one, we need to give knowledge. We need to improve people's financial literacy. That's the basic step. But unfortunately, often that's where we stop. We need to go a step further because it doesn't help if you have the knowledge but you don't know how to implement it. I don't know how to do a budget. I don't know how to start saving. That's the skills portion, the practicing. And it takes some time and it takes some effort. And that's why many people just stop there. And lastly, we need to ad adapt our behaviors. We need to address attitudes. Because if people don't think they can improve their circumstances, if they don't want to improve these circumstances, no amount of knowledge and no amount of skills will make a difference. We need to address behavior. And then wellness and stress. I think in the financial industry, the time that we only looked at finances um, is long gone. We need to look at well-being and wellness more holistically because of all these stress impacts, because it affects people on a broader um, sense. And we need a lot of the research on that shows that companies that become involved assisting their people with financial well-being, with overall well-being, actually get a very good return on that because people are less absent from work, they are more productive at work if they don't need to worry about their finances all day. So things can be done, but it's going to be a consolidated effort between the financial insurance industry, between employers, between government, between the employees. Because nobody on their own can bring this together. And I, need, I think we need to have a lot of discussion on this in future. What can we do as a South African community to address this matter starting at schools? Then I want to end off with the last one. About four out of ten people not or only have a financial advisor. That for me is a big concern, but of course I totally agree with John on that one as well. I always ask people, um, I have a little mole here in my beard. Um, it's not serious. Would I go and operate and cut it out myself to save some money? Most definitely not. And we need to get used to seeing the financial advisor as a professional providing a service. But there are some obstacles that I think we need to consider. We have an excellent industry, I think, in South Africa, but heavily regulated, making it expensive for financial advisors to service lower income people. And that's not unique to South Africa. We see it globally. We need to find something or a model to assist the lower income people that's not immediately profitable for financial advisors. And we can, I honestly say, we cannot blame them because you are a financial advisor because of a, a business incentive. And I do, I know that a lot of them do a lot of work without compensation. Again, like John said. So maybe we should be looking at financial coaches that's less regulated that's being employed in companies to assist people to just get started in the right way. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you. I want to thank Old Mutual for the opportunity afforded to me um, to just provide some additional insight on this survey. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Prof. Uh, if I was still in varsity, your lecture I would definitely not miss because uh, those were really insightful uh, thoughts that you shared with us there. Thanks, sir. So, so just speaking to the um, 
very important point that you uh, raised around knowledge and what's knowledge if we uh, don't have that step further um, and the know-how to implement that which we know. And so uh, things are bad, but then how do we fix them, right? So John gave us a bit of a step guide as to his thinking on how to, but I think now you're going to take it a little bit further in terms of how to implement uh, that knowledge which we do know. So we're looking forward to your presentation once again, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, Fifi. Um, yeah, so fortunately, um, I don't have lots of slides like earlier on, so I am sure some of you are thinking, oh, did they say he's going to present again? <laughs> um, so I think the one question that we need to answer is, what is old mutual doing to help consumers? Because the fact that we've made an effort to do this, con uh, conduct this study, to understand, to scan uh, and understand the landscape better, after knowing, then what? So we have uh, been working as old mutual as we've always been offering financial education. So we decided we're going to focus on how do we impact behavior? beyond just disseminating information. There's a gap between knowing and doing. I'm sure some of you sitting here, beginning of this year, you had New Year's resolutions. You were going to lose about 10 Ks. <laughs> you even subscribed. You've got uh, this gym fees. You paid the first two months. You went there a couple of times. You went to the sauna. And then after that, you stopped going. The question is, why is it that people know the right things to do, but they don't do? We know we have to eat vegetables. We, you know, to stay healthy, we need to eat well. But do we do it? No. We know that we need to exercise. Do we do it? Why is there a gap between knowing and doing? It means we lack the requisite motivation to actually change. It's not really about just knowing. Knowing is not enough. But knowing better is good because when you know better, you know that this knowledge is not going to help me unless I do something about it. So we've uh, been working on producing a tool to measure behavior when we run these financial education uh, sessions across the country. But more so, how do we provide a tool for continuous engagement? Because it's not enough to just offer people a, a, a knowledge session and then you disappear. It's about how do we engage you on a continuous basis to the extent that uh, your behavior starts changing. You know, it's not an overnight uh, uh, thing that can just happen like that. So I'm going to play this clip uh, to introduce a new tool, a new experience, and I believe uh, some of the tools may be useful even to yourselves uh, as, as media people. So let me play this clip. Old Mutual takes pride in measuring behavior impact of our financial education programs and tools. We've developed an interactive digital tool designed to track behavioral and attitudinal shifts of our participants through pre and post assessments. The integration of our various financial education digital platforms enables us to produce data analytics and verifiable data of the employee financial well-being profile of our corporate clients and the broader community groups, including trade unions and stock files. Introducing our On The Money digital tool and financial education WhatsApp experience, the ultimate solution for improving your financial literacy and taking control of your finances. Registering is easy. Simply scan the QR code or enter the six digit session code during our financial education session. Provide your personal details, consent to the terms on a secured and highly protected site, and check in to embark on your journey to financial freedom. All Poppy protocol observed. Discover the big five secrets of effective money management that will enable you to live your best life. Initially, we'll ask you a series of questions to understand your financial decision-making influences, debt knowledge and spending habits. Then we'll assess your financial knowledge and confidence level in your ability to manage your money to assist you in making informed choices. Your behavioral shifts will be tracked over a 12-month period. Next, it's time to take action. Set realistic goals to start your journey towards living your best life.
stay connected with us by adding us on WhatsApp and following the prompts on the main menu. Our on-the-money WhatsApp platform has an artificial intelligence bot which can answer any personal financial management question. You can financially educate yourself in the comfort of your home at any time through our On The Money chat by simply typing the word chat. By being money smart, you can even earn old mutual rewards points. These points can be redeemed as cash or through any of our retail partners. You can continuously enhance your knowledge by using the 22.7 app to track your spending, savings and investments. It's a valuable tool that will help you stay informed and in control of your money. It's time to take charge of your financial future. Get started with our On The Money WhatsApp bot and benefit from the AI chat today. Um, let me let me invite you to um, load the, the WhatsApp. Uh, load us on, connect with us on WhatsApp. Um, it's, it's, you can either save that number or alternatively, you can scan that uh, QR code with your phone. And um, yeah, and then just go and have fun. You can ask uh, the bot as many questions and, as, as you may wish. Um, the bot is a 12-year-old AI. So you have to train an AI uh, to be able to behave in a particular way, to be able to answer specific questions. So we've, this is a 12-year-old that you are dealing with. She's a 12-year-old. Uh, others will say, why is she? Okay. <laughs> the, 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 what should I say? They. they. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So the AI is a 12-year-old. Uh, we'll continue to train it, so so you can ask any. I mean, the other day I was invited uh, to do an interview, and I needed to research something about a particular topic. I simply went there and I spent some time. Voila! I was I was so confident about the subject matter because of that. It will be certainly a useful resource even for yourselves as journalists, um, you know, because uh, there's a lot uh, that you can learn. Uh, from it. But also, uh, you know, the room next door, um, there's a much bigger screen if you want to play around there. I know a colleague of mine decided to ask the board, how can I get rich quick? <laughs> and, the board, and the board says, you are confused. <laughs> uh, so there's a bit of humor there. Uh, yeah, but please, we'd certainly welcome you uh, to, to enjoy yourself and learn, and you can do this. Apart from the AI board, there's a menu there, and in the menu, there are a couple of things you can do. If you need help with Drafting, drafting a free will. There's a link that, uh, that you can tap into there. If you need to speak to a financial advisor, you can simply click there to ask for a financial advisor, or you can watch one of our podcasts, or you might sign up for All Mutual Rewards, or you might want to uh, sign up for our 22.7 app uh, in terms of a budgeting tool. So there's a lot that you can do apart from the AI uh, piece. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Thanks, John. And uh, I think that's, yeah, hopefully that was enough time for uh, everyone to scan the QR um, for the online audience as well. So we are going to get into answering uh, some of the questions that have come through, uh, but I'll start uh, asking you to raise your hands in just a short while. Uh, there are a few uh, questions that have come through on the online or from the online audience. Those of you who haven't sent, you can still do so uh, through the uh, comments section. But before I do invite the speakers to join me up on stage to uh, answer those questions. So Old Mutual did go out and um, spoke to a couple of people on the field, just uh, wanted to get an authentic feel as to how they are um, feeling around the economy right now. So I just would like to ask for your patience just to watch some of the footage that the team was able to get and uh, also perhaps get your thoughts on it uh, shortly after. My current household is my mom, myself and, and my sister. I sell clothes. I work as an operations manager. So I have kids and I live with my sister's kids as well. The six of us. My kids come first. School fees is my top priority. Whatever it is that I'm thinking of doing financially, I have to make sure Bana they are okay. My financial planning is more structured around number one, making sure I've got a roof over my head, making sure there's food on the table. Would I have enough to survive when I retire? I've seen a lot of my older generation struggle 
and they had their savings, it's just not enough. You can't just fork out 50% of your salary towards uh, retirement. If it's not a good month on sales, my brother would pull through. And I thank my mom and my sister for their support during those times as well. A lot of my income depends on setting goals and achieving those goals. And if you don't, then those come with penalties as well. I always tell my staff, your first thing you do when you get paid, set aside your transport money so that you can get to work. I'm not big on entertainment. I'd rather stay in. We kind of have a come dine with me vibe between myself and my friends and family. So you know that the meal is being made at home. You're not going out and just paying for it. I, I'm not getting any financial advice. At the end of the month, I don't have any money to save. Five to 10 years ago, I think I was a bit of a reckless spender. Right now, I'm trying to purchase a vehicle, but there's some debt from way back when that's still sitting there and hindering me from getting. I could get credit. But now, because I fall behind on payments sometimes. I've done a lot of damage with credit, credit cards and loans and debt and stuff like that. And now I'm just trying to fix that. A lot of patience is required. I think what would be attractive to me right now would be like a, a family trust to make sure in Dubana, my kids don't face whatever that I'm facing now. They are able to have stability. Insurance is important. Insurance cover, I've learned. One of the most important things to have. It's not something I would think of on, on a daily basis because mine is to just survive. I've learned from what I've done and the mistakes I've made. Watch how you spend financially. Really, I, I should be planning financially for a future. I am. Even if I put 200 rands down. There will never be a day, I think even till I hit 65, where things are going to be easy. You're going to have to work hard for what you want because it never comes easily. That's, that's something I've always learned. Quick, to the point that you are making. Uh, there's another video uh, that I think will provide for a very nice contrast because the, essentially the individuals there are probably between the 35 and the 50 age grouping. So before that video plays, I'd actually would like to ask the panelists to come and join me on stage and we can watch it from here and we can talk about it uh, right after. So Prof. Roche, Vuyo, uh, John, please come through and I think that Isaac will also uh, be joining us. And as they make their way, uh, if we can just cue in the uh, second video, just to give us a sense of how a younger grouping is thinking about the economy and their money right now. What wakes me up in the morning is my desire to make money. <laughs> yes, and lots of it. And my household uh, cannot be only maintained by the salary, so I started sort of looking into ways that I can actually get more income. The standard of the things that I like is a bit up there, so I need to make sure that my hustle is on point. Okay, so my side hustle is floristry. The nature of my side hustle is based in beautifying a woman in hair care. I'm hoping to venture to makeup artistry as well. Apart from it giving me some finance and money on the side, um, it just gives me a lot of joy. Too. So I want to um, monetize my talents more so that they're the ones that are creating wealth for me. So I essentially took this leap of faith because uh, um, nobody owes you anything in life. You are accountable of your own dreams. You make things happen. And that keeps me up at night. It makes me wake up in the morning because I need to know that I have to hustle to get the things that I want to get. Be paying me mas myself a salary from my, my main income. Uh, my side hustle just provides me the, the space to spend money. My floristry business is predominantly um, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I don't have a website um, and all of my sales go through um, Instagram, Facebook and then email and then that's how I place my orders and then also WhatsApp. So I use uh, my side hustles uh, solely on uh, social media. So I post my pictures there of how I actually make the wigs and how I wash them, the installations. 
obviously, I mean, there's campaigns um, that I run. Um, I use influencers sometimes, and then I also use my my own page to market my services. Short-term goals will be to ensure that I do not incur any debt, uh, have a solid, solid, solid way of living in terms of my finances for a good three years. Um, I want to grow my business, obviously. So now I just want to take into account on how I maintain uh, my lifestyle. And a long-term goal will be creating wealth for my family, ensuring that they also have income while I pass away and they don't need to actually work as hard as I do. So on my wish list right now, I want me a Range Rover autobiography and I want to buy it cash. So that's, that's the goal. At least she wants to buy it cash, right? <laughs> um, uh, we're getting into Q&A right now, but I think perhaps maybe just a quick take from you guys in terms of the uh, two groupings. Uh, of South Africans, uh, different ages, different approaches to uh, their money and uh, they, how they see it. Prof. Shep, perhaps your quick take on what stood out for you. Now, I think there's clearly a difference in the, in the generations. Um, we see a lot of positivity from the, the younger people, which is um, good. Um, again, but we must remember there's a lot of them that's unemployed. So there's a, there's a, a large portion of people that's not, not represented in that. But I think we can see them being positive. We can see them not concentrating on one job, but they are improving their financial situation. Um, and that makes us positive. And I think that uh, the um, comments that you made in your presentation about uh, some of the psychology of a second income, when you think of it as a second income, it uh, gets uh, filtered into your main and you spend it rather than saving it or paying off debt comes through there. Vuyo, just in terms of your key takeaways from the two groupings? Yeah, just for me, I think the difference in terms of financial stress that you can see is quite significant. I think the debt and debt averseness is consistent, which is great in terms of younger people saying, I don't want to be in debt, and older people saying, I've learned from my mistakes. So you see that, I think, is quite consistent. But the difference for me was probably around the financial stress point, just seeing the, the dependency, and you know, John spoke about the sandwich generation, et cetera. And I think just to, to add to what Prof was saying earlier, of the people who, you know, and we said 45% of, of working South Africans are highly stressed, seven out of 10 of those people actually have now started to note the mental health impact and the, the health impact or just overall, specifically around mental health. So I think that for me is, is a standout and very consistent with what we saw in the results. Yeah. Sure. And uh, also, I mean, uh, different groupings, but similarities also. No one was talking about, no, I want to make money and uh, invest in this and make money and save for that. So commonalities, uh, despite the differences. John, just your key takeaways. Look, I think the, the older guy, almost like he left everything in God's hands. Uh, but I think the, the, the younger generation is a lot more creative. And I think, you know, they know how to use social media to market their products. Sim one of the simplest way of actually uh, creating awareness and, and marketing uh, products. So I think it's really about people learning the new ways and new tools of actually uh, starting a business. Uh, and, and that's why young people are able to actually generate an income through social media platforms. Sure. Whereas the, the much older generation, for them, you know, it's, it's, we're not that good uh, with social media. Yeah. Sure. sure. Perhaps a solution, tag up with a young person or hire a young person. So, so uh, just questions. We are about to wrap up. Um, and I just wanted to know if there were any questions from the uh, physical audience. First, uh, Particularly, okay, I see a hand there. Uh, there's a question. Isak, I'm coming to you first because uh, something has come uh, for you as well uh, early on in your presentation. And I just also would like to mention that there is a representative from Old Mutual, um, one of the executives, uh, who is here uh, to uh, speak to us specifically about the, uh, the two-part system. I'll introduce her in just a short while. So if there are any questions related to that, don't hold back. There's someone who um, is here to talk about that. But uh, Isaac, just to you, sir, it uh, was related to the, um, the comments that you made around um, the rates and the quantum uh, to which the uh, home loan had increased in the... Uh, 
period of time, uh, the, the reference time that you had used. So the question is, was the, what was the first home loan repayment as at the 21st of November? And it is coming from the Daily Maverick. The 21st of November in 2021, I presume. Um, November 2021. Yeah, uh, I think it was on the on the chart. Um, it went up from from 7,700 uh, when interest rates were low, and today it's gone up to 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 more than 10,000. And I I simply used a, a bond calculator that's available anywhere on the internet to make the calculation. So you can you can very really easily go and can play around and see how different uh, different size of bond would have increased over certain periods of time. Um, bearing in mind also that that people's incomes have some of them at least have increased over the last over the last two years. So it's not as if uh, you, you know if you're earning a, a salary, you know, maybe that's also increased over that period. OK. Thanks so much. So, as I said, uh, we do have a representative from uh, Old Mutual to uh, speak a little bit about the two-part uh, system. Uh, so, um, it's uh, Michelle Acton, uh, and uh, Michelle, perhaps just uh, hope that you have a, a mic there. Just one question uh, to you uh, before I get to the gentleman who has uh, raised his hands. Uh, just regarding the sandwich generation, uh, the results are showing that um, some interesting uh, things happening and dynamics around the sandwich generation. Just how do you, you see the two-part system changing some of these dynamics in future? Thanks very much, Fifi. Um, so I think what's important to remember with the two-part system and the change, I think it was mentioned earlier around the ability to have some sort of access um, moving forward, which I think will resolve some of the emergency savings. But the other element is around the compulsory preservation. And I think there were some stats put up coming out of the survey, which made reference to, I think it was 70% or so of people who have accessed their retirement savings um, have been cashing it and using it to spend other things. And then you have the comment that came out in the video where somebody was mentioning about the fact that their parents um, was, were working and they saved, but they didn't save enough for retirement. And so what's going to be happening in the future is that ability to be able to cash out all your retirement savings when you change jobs is going to be removed. And what that means is it means people are going to be forced to save their money for longer. So what we're going to see happening in 10 and 20 years time is people who are working now when they reach retirement are going to have significantly bigger retirement values in which to survive on. And so what that will mean is there'll be a lot less dependency because we know a lot of people now we're supporting are our parents who might have had a job and worked, but because they weren't saving or cashing out their pension when they were changing jobs, when they finally get to retirement are having those those very small retirement values. And we see those retirement values triple, um, doubling and tripling over the next 20 years, which will result in significant improvement for retirement values. So possibly higher than the 50,000. It's a 50,000 that you said uh, currently sits much higher. So that's a good development. But so you had a question? Yeah. Kindly introduce yourself briefly. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ms. Peters. Uh, my name is Promit. I am from Reuters. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, actually a few of them, uh, especially on the survey. The 1,518 people, what income group do they represent? And then what part of the population they come from? Uh, for example, in terms of numbers, like is it 5 million, 10 million, 15, what? Yep. So it's 8,000 to 99,999. <laughs> and it's really the, it's, nas it's na uh, nationally representative of the working population in South Africa. So I think Prof spoke to the fact that obviously you're unemployed and, and South Africans earning less than 8,000 Rand a month would not be represented in the data that we shared today. So that's, that's not in, um, as part of the survey, but the 8,000 to 100,000 Rand effectively is the working population and it's representative of the full um, set of working South Africans. So it includes uh, from the lower income group to the top level. Exactly. The... So 8,000 to 100,000 is, is across the band effectively. So you're, you're not going to see, for example, what would be defined as a high net worth individual, for instance, in the data that you see now, but it is representative of the full band. So low all the way to high and income. Uh, any idea what will be the number of population of that, uh, that band? Sure, we can give it to you. We have the data, so we can we can share that with you after okay, the yeah, session. Be Absolutely. Helpful. Uh, yeah. Secondly, uh, so when you say that these most of these people, we are seeing that they have lo lost confidence in the economy mm -hmm. or confidence in the country. How is it translating into 
concrete steps that they're taking or not taking uh, uh, because they don't have confidence in South Africa. In terms of like behavior and change. In, yes. In... I mean, so I know that you said or uh, spoke about that they are um, some, there was a slide which spoke about some factors. Yeah. But that looks like more because of inflation than losing confidence in the economy. But when we are losing confidence in the economy, it's over and above inflation. It's also because of load shedding, the kind of infrastructure, for example, the potholes or long queues at traffic signals, all those things. Right. So I want to understand how does it translate into the concrete steps perhaps I am not taking or I might be taking for that. So, so yeah, I yeah. think you're also I think perhaps, uh, looking for maybe clues on maybe immigration yeah. as so to whether that to... is is resulting as a result of the lack of confidence, which the survey actually speaks to. It does actually speak to that. So I think we can share that data with you. I think it's in the full reports that will go out this afternoon. So we do have a section looking at specifically around immigration. So are people more likely to immigrate now that given you know where we are? And we do track that um, at long term. We look at things like offshore investments. Are people starting to invest more offshore, which we have seen. So that's increasing over the between 2022 and 2023. So I do think there's a slight change from an investment pattern behavior is starting to look more at offshore, people are starting, and again, I think Prof spoke to this really nicely in terms of people are starting to take more risks. So gambling, things like that have increased. And then obviously the immigration point, and I don't have the data points on hand, but we do have that data to share as well around some of the immigration patterns and a little bit on the why, not necessarily um, a focus of the study, but we do have that information. Okay, that'll be helpful if I can get hold of that. Sure. Okay. Uh, another thing that I wanted to ask oh, you is... Oh, Pramit, maybe yeah. uh, John actually uh, wants sure, to add sure, in in terms ahead. of that yeah. question you had. I think, I think one of the risks of uh, people losing confidence uh, in the economy is that it creates a room for opportunistic criminal elements, like you saw with uh, rioting in KZN. You know, when people feel that, uh, uh, you know what, I might as well. You know, so we know that uh, e even that time, you know, people feeling the pinch... Uh, so that, that's another risk uh, that, that can present itself. Okay. okay uh, um, just so. one, last, one last comment. Any other questions before Pramit continues? Okay, wonderful. So go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, so just two more questions. I won't take much of your time. Uh, what I wanted to also understand is that I found a little dichotomy into, in what Isaac was saying and into what you presented. You said that the debt levels in South Africa are, is increasing and a lot of people have fallen behind in payments sometimes. But when uh, Isaac was talking, he said that uh, this uh, debt service ratio is currently 8%, which looks like more or less average of the last 10 years. And the debt to income ratio has also fallen. So why is this dichotomy? I mean, the numbers should actually be reflecting, right? These ratios should be reflecting what we are seeing from the report, right? Okay. So I, I will answer quickly and then I'll hand it over to Isak. But sure. I think the main reason is because there's a lag. So what we're reporting on is 2022 versus 2023. And the survey gets done between April and May of this year. So that's the first thing is that from a timing perspective, it's not real time. It's not today, right? Then secondly, I think there's also the fact that, again, when we are doing the survey, we're asking people about their finances. So, and I think Prof's example illustrated that, that actually from real term perspective, they are earning less, they have less money in their pocket and they are then, you know, getting into more loans versus last year, they are asking family and friends, et cetera, for more debt. So those are some of the things that, and, I'm, and Isak will speak to, to the macro specifically, but from a personal finance perspective, those behaviors are definitely trending in that direction that we shared in terms of higher indebtedness, people not being able to keep up with home loans, et cetera. And we did see that the interest rates have a factor in that. But I think those for me, from my perspective, is like, and you can add, I think it's one is, is just purely timing in terms of the lag between the study and real time today. And two, again, you're looking at personal perspectives on people's finances versus macros and kind of more high level uh, data. Yeah, I think I think it's it's to to that last point. Um, so so, you know, the, the fact that people are in the survey are falling behind on their mortgage payments is not necessarily a reflection of interest rates. It might be because other financial stress has uh, has picked up somewhere else, and you won't necessarily pick that up in the bond in the in the debt service ratio that I showed. That's number one, and then number two. Um, again, that's an aggregate number, 
and and South Africa is a very unequal society. So if you think about debt, if you think about you know a mortgage, you know someone buying a house, um, you know maybe two or three million rand versus someone with a store card that they're struggling to repay, which is maybe a few thousand rand. You know, so 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 a few houses will always will always trump many many small. Um, loans that, that that people have. So in aggregate, things look OK. But I think, as I said, you know, where this survey is very useful is to give you the detail in terms of um, different income segments, how they how they faring um, and, and also the personal experiences, which 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 are very important. And then a final point is I do think there is a segment of the South African population that have done quite well over the last the last couple of years, despite everything that's gone wrong. Right. So, so, so higher income people, people with skills, you know, suddenly now you can work, live in South Africa, you can work overseas because everything is, everything is digital. So you can earn dollars working in South Africa. Um, so we've seen, I think, in, in certain segments of the population, quite strong income growth. We've seen, as I said, decent returns from investments, and that obviously also goes into people's incomes. Um, so yeah, I, I think in the end, it's also a story around uh, different income segments, the inequality in the country, um, and the fact that we are looking at different perspectives, the one from the top down and the one from the bottom up that you're getting from the survey. Okay. I hope dichotomy dissected. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank All you right. very much. Thank uh, you. Perfect. You're good. Yes. Okay. okay. No, perfect. <laughs> uh, what I also wanted to say is that um, the, the you've got your pen, right? So www.oldmutual.coza uh, forward slash savings monitor. So that's where the uh, entire research is. You'll get all the findings on the different age groups, the different income breakdowns, uh, the gender differences, and it will answer, it will give you a lot more detail because I know you need to back up your story with the facts. Okay, <laughs> Pramit, thanks so much. And so, and so no more questions uh, in the room, or perhaps, uh, perhaps can I just take one more uh, question on the, the two part, Michelle, if you don't uh, mind indulging me with your patience just a little bit further. Um, given that the survey does say that less than 50% have of people have emergency savings, does this reinforce the need for the two part in your view? I think there are two elements that reinforce the need. The one was the beginning where we've really got a feel that people are just trying to do their best to make ends meet and there isn't any other money to put aside. So, I mean, the lady on the video was speaking the fact that my thing is just my kids schooling and feeding. And one of the benefits we're seeing and one of the reasons that the two-part system's coming through is it's saying, actually, we know that forced savings is the most effective way to help someone save. So, i.e., if I'm part of a pension fund and I work for an employer, automatically they're taking some of my money before it comes to me and it's now going to be put in the pension fund. Now, up until now, it just goes into the pension fund as it is and you don't look at it or see it until either you change jobs or retire. Now what's going to happen is some of that money is going to be allocated into a savings component and some of it into a pension component. And yes, it will take time to build up. And yes, from the implementation on day one, it's not going to solve everybody's financial woes because as we know, your money that you save, only that plus interest is what you can get out. But over the long term, what it means is every working South African on a retirement fund will automatically have an emergency savings vehicle built into their package. And I think that will make a big difference. We need to educate people who are not wanting to access it all the time, but at least we know that for those people who don't have the ability to put extra money, it's a cost-effective way of making sure you have some sort of emergency savings, but it does with that forced element, um, that forced savings element where it's taken off my salary before it lands into my paycheck, then it's going to make a difference. But it's also going to apply to retirement annuities. So it means for everybody who now puts money into a retirement annuity, some of that money can be available for emergency savings. So it will give a bit more flexibility than what our current system has. Okay. Michelle, thanks so much for that. And also to the panel, thanks so much for um, your insights also. We, or can I kindly ask that uh, you make yourselves comfortable once again on your seats in the audience members. Uh, we, are, I do understand that time is money and uh, we are running a little bit over time. And so just to not uh, keep you any further, uh, let's uh, get to wrapping up the session. And at this stage, I would like to invite on stage for our closing remarks, the uh, General Manager for Public Affairs and Sustainability at Old Mutual, uh, Ms. Tabby Zengiwe to give us her perspective on today's events. 
Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Just wanted to test if I'm audible. Um, so thank you very much um, to everybody for joining us. We really do appreciate your attention this afternoon. And uh, it really was quite a session unpacking this year's OMSIM results for 2023. And I'm sure you'll agree to, with me that the content is just a lot. I think uh, Prophet's questions were testament to that. I really do want to pass my own appreciation and huge congratulations to the colleagues um, who presented what they did today and really drilling into the results of what OMSIM has to offer for us. It is for us as old mutual. Oh, I must also, just by the way, Prof, thank you most sincerely for um, really drilling into the understanding of what you called the story behind the stats um, and helping us just to unpack the impact of what OMSIM was all about for us. I think the major strength um, of this research is that it is something that we undertake on an annual basis. Um, the information gleaned is always a reflection of how South Africans are coping with the challenges and the broader economic environment. For Old Mutual, OMSIM has certainly become our own flagship um, corporate um, a research product, and it is something that is really inseparable from our brand. Um, we have a proud history of using it to serve many generations, um, and it is something that really helps us in terms of understanding our own customer base as an organization and what our customers are most concerned about. And I, myself, as an employee of Old Mutual, am a potential or existing customer. So I am not removing myself from that bracket. We are absolutely dedicated about using this knowledge to provide services and solutions that actually are relevant and what our customers deserve. It provides value not only for the financial sector, but it does help all of us as South Africans to understand the forces shaping financial decisions that we make. And I think through an understanding of our personal finances, we can all take comfort from the fact that we are not alone. And most importantly, we can learn how to improve our finances and build a solid base for the future. This, I think, is what really sets OMSIM apart and makes it particularly valu valuable. It is not theoretical, con it's not a theoretical document, as you will see when you go onto our site and you drill into the detail that is provided. It is something that you can use for many, many, many areas of whatever stories you may wish to cover, but certainly some things that we hope you will put into practice. Um, levels of savings, including our emergency funds, are really at an all-time challenging situation, if I can put it that way. Stagnating, yes, but as OMSIM reveals, the need for these saving strategies is still in the consumer's minds. The more the need for savings remains top of mind, the more likely it is that ways of coping with financial roadblocks facing us will be developed. By acting now, taking a hard look at our finances with the assistance of a financial advisor. If I took nothing else out of today, and hopefully for those of you listening, with the assistance of a financial advisor, cutting back on unnecessary spending, setting budgets with goals, Range Rover, what was it? something Range Rover to be bought cash. <laughs> I think it's an ambitious goal, um, but she certainly sounds determined she's going to live by those goals. I think we also can just glean on how we then set ourselves on a path to really having future success and making our lives just a little easier. As Old Mutual, we are committed to playing a meaningful role in building a financially savvy nation. In addition to OMSIM, we have an always-on financial education program delivered through various channels, including our website, social media, and editorial opportunities. I'm very excited about the digital tool that John unveiled today. It's testament to the work that we continue to do to empower South Africans. So I invite you all to make sure that you go next door and you test it out for yourself. I am sure you'll find it extremely, extremely valuable. And times may be tough, and they may also get more demanding. But as the OMSIM tagline says, know better, do better. 
adding immediate action to this call will replace doubt and fear with the confidence and certainty that comes with being financially ready for the future. For my part, I really want to thank you for being with us today and I hope that you will enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Remember to go onto our website, oldmutual.co.za backslash savings monitor for more information on the OMSIM research and its findings. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Biography. The autobiography, yeah. So um, FYI, Bonto means uh, vision in Sesotho, right? To vision to dream. I know this because it's my second name. But <laughs> so she clearly has really, really, really big dreams. But uh, Tabby has said all the uh, things that you need to walk away with. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the, the website, she's mentioned it. That's great. I just I think that, I mean, everyone understands the language of money. And uh, as fellow representatives of the fourth estate, um, I think that from now on, uh, from here on, it's our um, responsibility to just share some of these insights with our uh, respective readers. Uh, they need it, and uh, hopefully they can be uplifted from these latest findings. Lunch is served next door, um, and also you'll be able to uh, try out the latest uh, digital tool from Old Mutual and uh, ask any of the representatives in the room any questions that perhaps you didn't get to. Uh, but uh, from myself, uh, for now, um, I'll see you next door. Thank you. <laughs>